She describes herself as the village girl. But Mary Wangari is not your average village girl. She rose up the ranks to become the group executive director of Equity Group. And now, 20 years later, she has exited. What's in store for her next? Let's find out on She Needs Business. I am your host, Claire Munde. Mary, you've had quite an illustrious career and just recently you completed 20 years at Equity Group and you took a final bow. Now, 20 good years, Group Executive Director, tell us what have been some of the highlights of your time at Equity Group? Thank you. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for the time. Um, what I can say is that my biggest highlight was actually making the decision to join Equity. Uh, because I transitioned from legal practice, I'm a, I'm, 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 I'm a lawyer by training, uh, but I made a decision that I will move to equity because I understood the purpose of empowerment and it really resonated with my personal purpose. It was very well aligned. And truly when I got to equity, it proved that uh, equity was about empowerment and it was about impact. It was about financial inclusion, things that resonated to with me and, and my goals also. So it's been a remarkable 20 years. Um, I have seen the business grow uh, from a very small building society. Uh, it was only three billion balance sheet when I joined. By the time I left uh, mid-year 2024, the balance sheet has gone to 1.8 trillion according to the published results and it's still growing. We were only in Kenya at that time, 2004 when I joined. By the time I left, we had operations, banking operations in six countries and we also had other non-banking subsidiaries including the Equity Group Foundation which is the social impact wing of the business. So uh, I'm truly delighted uh, that I was part of the team that caused that transformation. Wow, wow. congratulations yes. for that. Now, being there for 20 years, you've seen a lot happen. I mean, we've been through three presidents. Uh, we've had COVID pandemic. We've had so many things happening. Could you talk to us a little bit about the power of resilience and being able to have that staying power through different seasons in life? Because even right now, we're finding ourselves in a different situation in the Kenyan market. Tell us a little bit about resilience and how important it is. What I would say is that um, we, we, we make beautiful plans all the time, whether it's in our businesses, our careers, our personal lives. But as we all know, some eventualities happen. Life is not always a, a straight line as we would like it to be. So for me, what has been important over the years, and also seeing the dips in the economy over time, and, and as you said, uh, COVID came, we also had the interest rates capping, which was a very trying period for any banking or financial institution, uh, that was in Kenya specifically. And then we got the Russia-Ukraine crisis right after COVID when we thought we were settling down. Uh, and we've had election cycles also uh, throughout the region within um, various times. Uh, so what is important is first of all to plan, make plans um, that take into account such eventualities. And uh, if you are a business then you need to have sufficient capital buffers you know to keep you afloat even during the difficult times when the returns may not be very good every opportunity also presents a crisis mm. and that is what I've come to believe in the last uh, 20 years so instead of just complaining oh things are very tough oh the economy is so tight why can't you look for um, ideas either to make a few additional coins, additional revenues. And I have seen people who have even re-engineered their business models during a crisis. Like during COVID, we had a lot of people who actually did that. I mean, they had a taxi and they, it was booming business. They have taken a loan with the bank. Uh, but then when COVID came, what happens? 
you cannot uh, make even a cent. Your car is grounded. And somebody decided, okay, now my kids have to eat. They are at home. They have to drink. They have to dress. They have to sleep. Yeah. Everyone has, the family has to be comfortable, whether I have a passenger or not, you know, in my taxi business. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they decided to do was to, and they figured, okay, people are at home during COVID. So they, they are still eating. Mm. They have to eat. Mm. He started baking mm. cakes, cookies for the, for the neighbors. And then everyone now started sending uh, for cakes at Akinananis, you know, because they are very sweet. And the business boomed. Soon, he used that car to ferry as a distribution vehicle. Mm. And it was grounded before. That is what resilience means. Wow. It's you looking for what else can I do? Yeah. As I wait for things to, by the way, that guy never went to taxi business again. <laughs> <laughs> he went after, after COVID. Yeah, 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 because he had found a business that worked. Works, yeah. And the business model that he moved to as a result of a crisis worked very hard, worked very well for him. Wow. So that's how I understand resilience. And, and it's also about not giving up hope. Uh, that something, uh, there's something ahead for you. That's exactly what I did myself, even in my personal life. For those who have read my book, uh, when I talk about the circumstances I was brought up in, um, struggling quite a lot during my childhood, but I had my eyes on the goal. And the goal was, I have to get very quality education, get very high marks because uh, that's the only way I'll be able to move to the next level. And that is exactly what happened. I was able to move from the village and become a lawyer, qualified and licensed, start my practice, and eventually the bank found me and invited me to work for them for 20 years. Wow, great. Yeah. There are no results without hard work. Very important. None every, at all. Yeah, every yeah. crisis presents an opportunity. It does not matter how much we have faith mm -hmm. or we believe. Um, if we do not work, yeah. nothing will happen, nothing will change. Wow, wow, yeah. that's very powerful. Now you also talked about your mom and you also talk about her in your book, The Village Girl, yes. and you talk about her being a strict disciplinarian and yes. <laughs> you really had to live by the book. Yes. Now you also, having uh, three children, three girls, you've raised them. Talk to us, uh, this is She Means Business. There are women out there who are trying to balance work mm -hmm. and raising their families. And as mm -hmm. you've said, their results as long as you have hard work. But sometimes, especially during those early years, it becomes a bit difficult to balance. You want to grow your career, you want to go back to school. You said it's very important to get that education, but it becomes a little difficult. Speak to that woman and tell her, how do you balance all these things while you still have that eye on the ball where you want to go within your career? It is not easy because your time is divided. Uh, and there are many things that call for your time. We have the work that requires you at your desk or wherever you operate from, the factory. You have uh, your children, some are school grow going, they, they have obligations, they have to be dropped in school, some of them if they are not in boarding. Uh, some, I mean, we have our spouses, for those who have spouses or partners, uh, we have our extended family, some of us care for our sick parents. I cared for my mom for five years before she unfortunately passed on. Uh, and it's not easy. Uh, sometimes we also have other activities like church. Uh, for those who are Muslims, they probably have obligations in their communities. So there's a lot calling for our time. So uh, how the principle I apply is this. We should find the activities that we can delegate first. Get those ones out of the way. And, and me, I mean, for a very long time, I, I, I decided that I will empower my house manager completely. So I don't need to know whether she's buying ugali or hostess or, but I've given her the parameters and told her, this is what we buy in this house. Every week there's shopping to be done. She does the shopping. Of course, there are those very select issue items that I will buy myself when I have time, like on a weekend, I am more relaxed and all that. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I do not need to go to the shop to buy milk or go to the, the other place to buy tomatoes. No, 
uh, so she's empowered to do that and we have agreed on the menu she knows um, there's a day for chapos there's a day for ugali there's a day for githeri she knows i love githeri so she cooks that quite often <laughs> yeah. so you empower them but what is important is for us to divide whatever time is available between four things and the first one uh, because it's the same being that is the mother the worker the the self you know so divide your time between uh, four things which are critical to your life uh, this is now what we call the work life integration or harmony um, and the first one is there is my physical and mental health it is important for me to care for myself and to take care of myself the second one is um, my spiritual needs I need either to go to church I have a small Christian community where we have also some obligations, meetings, and, and it's also a meeting point for us. Uh, there's uh, daily reflections, there's meditations, there's all those fall under, um, under that, the, what we call the soul set. And the third one is the intellectual and the work side, which we call the mindset. This is where we work. We self-develop, we register for those programs or trainings or whatever. That is also important. And the final one is the heart set. We have reserved time for those we love and who require special attention. Our children, our spouses, our partners, and those very special relationships. So we allocate time for those ones where we can. Now, there are circumstances where the time is not equally divided. And actually, most of the time, it's not equally divided. Mm. Because if I'm working on a project, or when I was in the bank and I used to travel in the region, I mean, I could not um, be with my family if I'm in Uganda or I'm in, in a DRC. Uh, but when I come back, I have then allocated time when I'm around. It's also important to have a supportive team mm. who also understand what women go through mm. and what they require. So whether they are men or women, they need to know. I have a small baby. Once in a while, I will spend my night at Gertrude's or the other hospital. Uh, so you will excuse me. And there's someone who is willing to step in seamlessly for you. So those are the strong supportive networks that we can create. We can also create networks with our family members if we are living close with them. Wow, wow, yeah. those are very good points. Yeah. Delegation and a very strong support system. And support system. Yeah. yeah. Now I want us to talk a little bit about uh, personal development. You've touched on it a bit mm. and also personal branding uh, because very many people, women, you're trying to rise up, but who are you? You've talked about passion and purpose. How do you use those two de to determine what kind of personal brand you want to portray uh, out there as you build yourself? You know, self-development has to be very intentionally done uh, it cannot be done just ad hoc and uh, for me it all depended on the stage uh, of my career development I was going through now if I give you an example when I was in private practice most of my personal development was in the legal space until the time I decided now I want to shift gear and more go more into a career that allows me to do more social development in some form. I didn't know what it was. And that is when I was thinking, maybe I need to do women's rights and, or, you know, something like that, something different, or human rights generally. Um, that is the time I registered for the um, uh, gender and development program at the University of Nairobi. And that allowed me to appreciate that women's rights space even more than I had before during my legal training although I had basic training and I also I also acted quite a bit uh, to support women who are in distress child support um, divorces and all that some of them cannot afford fees so I used to work for with FIDA quite quite a bit and Kituo Cha Sharia now so you identify based on what your goals are 
I did that and then I was ready to move on to another space. And I really wanted to do women's, something to do with men's rights. But then when equity came, and I understood, equity supports the financially included. Mm. Majority of them are women. It fitted perfectly uh, in my space and in my personal goal. And I felt it was very well aligned. So, but when I joined equity in 2004, I got a shock mm. because this is a financial institution. It's a completely, totally yeah. uh, different ball game from my legal practice, yeah. where I was in comfort zone. So I had to learn the basics of banking. I had to learn the basics of financial, you know, anything finance, uh, interpreting financials, accounts, and I did a lot of that. I, and that's when I also did a lot of programs, Strathmore Business School, I did the advanced management program. I, I, and then I became the company secretary and I was sitting on the board as a secretary. Now, I needed to ad understand more the governance principles. That is when now I went to Strathmore again and I did programs like the effective director and a, a few other governance related programs just to, um, to, to make me more familiar with that space and make me very good at what I'm doing. Because I think the idea is whichever area you decide to focus on, become the best, mm. become a master in that area. And that is what I chose to become. I, I am good in governance. I can brag. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, when I got the role of strategy and we started doing the regional businesses, we started with Uganda and then South Sudan, Rwanda, Tanzania, and then DRC. It was important for me to improve my leadership skills. So that is when I also did a few uh, leadership programs. Eventually I did the Masters in Innovation, Leadership and Change from York University uh, to be able to better that area. So it all depends on what you're dealing with. When I got the role of the Group Executive Director now to oversee the regional subsidiaries, I needed to improve now my global leadership skills because now I'm leading in the region. Different cultures, different uh, aspects and, and views and uh, you know, so I really needed to be good for that role. That's when I did the Harvard AMP program. So what is important is at whatever stage we are, we try to figure out what leadership skills do I need? What technical skills do I need? And then what general knowledge do I need mm. to be able to do very well in this space? And then work towards building those capabilities by one program or another. Now, for my mentees, I'm telling them right now, if you have not started paying attention to things like data security, uh, things like artificial intelligence, those are the things that are ruling the world now. Yeah. You have to understand them right now. Because there's nothing we can do right now without artificial intelligence. Yeah. Let's understand the basics. I know sometimes you say, oh no, me, I'm executive, so those things are for the technical <laughs> IT guys. AI is for all of us. Yeah. We have to understand how it works and how it also affects our our lives yeah. because even when we are using our phones and for those who have gone to TikTok like me <laughs> it's <a> artificial intelligence <laughs> yeah, on TikTok. and machine learning I'm on TikTok <laughs> if you didn't know okay. oh, <laughs> I'm <that's> there <laughs> that's amazing yeah, I, I like that so you talk about comfort zone get out of that comfort zone and out. move with the, the times yeah? yes exactly yeah, yeah, the comfort like, zone is actually me I would say the comfort zone is the enemy of growth both in career and also in businesses mm. or whatever else we are doing. Mm. So long as we sit in the comfort zone, we are not likely to advance much yeah. because we are used to doing the same, same things, the same, same way with the same, same people. Uh, we see opportunities out there, we block them off mm. because either we feel they are too difficult, but nothing comes easy and mm. we are living in a very competitive environment. If you have your degree, you have to remember that you are competing with people sitting in Seattle mm. 
yeah. and people sitting in uh, Europe people sitting in South Africa, Johannesburg and elsewhere, and people sitting in Lagos. Yeah. It is no longer that time we used to, to compete with our classmates <laughs> who we are seeing here. Yeah. Those times are gone. Yeah. And I mean, and now we are also competing with machines. Yeah. Yeah. We need to figure out what is, what is going on yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the world. Yeah. yeah. And I think also parents need to allow their children to learn encourage them to learn yeah. encourage them also to venture into talents and courses that are not traditional because i think we've also seen a case where we are still stuck i wanted to be a lawyer yeah. my child has to be a lawyer i wanted to be a doctor my child has to be a doctor why do you want to, your child to be what you did not become mm. or what you became let them become their best self, yeah. what they are meant to be. Yeah. Just encourage them, support them. Yeah, I think that's Allow very important. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, these days you hear like parents talking about sign up your child for coding. I mean, you don't have to do the simple things that everyone you did, your parents took you to. Yeah. So open up your mind. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That, that's really good. Mm. Now, so 20 years at Equity and then now you exit, you announce you're, you're exiting. Uh, mm. That was in June. Um, so maybe I can ask, oh, what next? We've seen you... <laughs> <laughs> we've seen you doing a lot of uh, tours with the village girl. Yes. Uh, we've seen you doing a lot of things, but we want to know what next for Mary. I mean, the village girl who has gone to the peak group executive director. I know that is just the beginning. What can we expect from you now? Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, I, I think um, maybe I'll just take you a little bit back and tell you that um, the reason why I wrote the village girl is because my mentees challenged me. Uh, because uh, when they saw an, an item that had been done on me in the media, they were so fascinated and they would say, well, oh, your story is so inspiring. Until you didn't wear shoes until you were in uh, high school. And I'm like, yes, and you are where you are now, yes. So they found that that very inspiring. Tell us how it happened. How can I be like you? That was a common question. Have you written a book? I want to write, to read more of this story. That is why I wrote the book. Mm. And when I released the book last year, um, on my birthday, it was because I told myself, I have realized that I have amassed a lot of knowledge in equity uh, and in my private practice, because from my, the time of my um, graduation, it is now 34 years. So I have a combined experience of 34 years, 20 in the bank and 14 in legal practice. And, and of, of course, so many other engagements, including sitting on the board and all that. And, and, and I'm finding that people are seeking to know, how did you move from point A to point B? Can you tell us how you move from legal to banking? Can you tell us how you rose through the lines from a junior legal services manager to the group executive director that you exited us. Can you tell us how you managed to sit on all those boards, all those years? What can I do to get on a board? And so many other questions that people are asking. So for me, uh, the last one year, within of course the time constraints that um, I was in a full-time job, I have started the mentorship program and uh, you will see me in all the channels. I have talked about financial literacy, I've talked about innovations, I've talked about leadership, I've talked about so many things, and I continue talking. I have done countless speaking engagements, probably more than 60 by now, since last year. And, and I could only take the ones I could do within the time limitations I had. But now I have more time to do more engagements and because I also realize that people usually have a lot of questions. They want to know how, 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 why, why, why. So I'm willing to answer that. So for now, it's mentorship. I'm also doing a bit of teaching. Uh, I've been to Strathmore Business School, uh, but uh, to be very honest, I'm still working on my more definitive plan for the next few years. So that is not very clear right now. 
But in the meantime, mentorship is keeping me busy and, and I'm truly enjoying it awesome. through and through. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Now, as we wrap up, maybe you could speak to those women uh, starting out their careers and even those who are in mid-level, or mm -hmm. even the executives, uh, if there's one thing you could leave them with yes. on achieving uh, all that they want to be, what is it that you would tell them and overcoming obst obstacles to just shine? Mm. I think the first thing to overcome is the fear of leadership and the fear of growth. Because, you know, we always say that um, there can be no growth without, without change. And change is painful. So the first thing we need to overcome is that fear of change. Because we have to change. If I had not moved from my comfort in legal, I would still probably be practicing lawyer. I would not have had the experience I did in equity. So let's overcome that fear of changing from what we are doing now to what we could do and have the confidence to try. Mm. Uh, so, and, and that is also why I started the, the, the Women in Leadership program at Equity. We call it Equip. Uh, just to try to give the women confidence that they can lead. So I, I used to tell them, if you see an, an internal uh, advertisement, apply even if you meet 70% of the criteria. Because the women, sometimes they wait for 100%. Yeah. yeah. yeah? Mm. But uh, we may not never get 100%. Yes. So, if you have 70%, please submit. If they say no, at least you know what to work on. Next time, you will get it. So, overcome that fear and go for it. I always say, if you look at my book, the parting shot is, if you do not step forward, you remain in the same place. Yeah. And that's the same thing I would like to tell you. Do not agree to, to stay in the same place. Move in some direction. It may be the right direction. It could be the wrong direction. But if you don't move, you will not know if it's the wrong direction. Wow. So move. Move. Yes. Move. Awesome. That's a, a very strong and powerful parting shot. Mm. And you've heard it. All you have to do is move. It may or may not be the right direction, but you must move. And as she said, change is painful, but it's necessary if you want to grow. This has been She Means Business, and we've been talking to Mary Wangare Wamai on her journey from the village girl to the group executive director of Equity, and now as a mentor as she charts out her future. This has been She Means Business. I have been your host, Claire Munde. Until next time, have a good one.